good to see you and welcome everybody. Uh, this is the workshop on information theoretic models in uh, psychology and in neuroscience. Information theory is a relatively recent field in mathematics and it uh, is about 70 years old and uh, it came uh, uh, about as a follow-up to discoveries, important discoveries in more traditional fields uh, like uh, probability theory and statistical mechanics and people uh, and the work of people like Kolmogorov and uh, Gilbert and Boltzmann. It has thus an amazing pedigree of applications ranging from algorithm complexity theory in computer science to efficient coding in neuroscience and psychology and the hope for this workshop is that we will be able to uh, canvas some of these applications and i'd like to thank the speakers for sharing their work and for their contribution at this rate uh, and also my co-organizers el miller and uh, randy galstel for their help a few logistical remarks before we begin our first session uh each talk will be about 20 to 25 minutes long and then we'll have a discussion section and a question section. You can ask questions uh, using the functionality at the bottom. You see there's ask a question box. And then I can read them out loud or, or the chair for the session can do that or we can bring you up on screen. Um, there are uh, also four sessions for, uh, in our workshop that you can find basically uh, by clicking on more on the top uh, left corner of your crowdcast below the words CNS 2020 workshop three. And uh, so we'll have three talks in the beginning with a, a small break in between each one of those. And then there will be an hour long break and we'll reconvene for the afternoon session. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Jonathan Pillow from Princeton, who will talk about connecting perceptual bias and uh, discriminability with parallel efficient codes. Thanks, Jonathan. The floor is yours. OK. Um, you want to share your screen? How do I share my screen now? Let's see. I, so uh, you click on top. There are the buttons okay. uh, above, your, above your face. You can see the buttons. And there is a button with a screen and an arrow, second from the right. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yep, should work. Excellent. I'm going to hit play now. Can you see that? Yep. You can see the, the full slide. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, so thank you very much, Demetrius, uh, and the other organizers for inviting me. It's a, a great pleasure to be with you all today, although it's too bad we can't be together in person. Um, so today I'd like to tell you about some recent work uh, that I have uh, been doing in my lab with a very talented graduate student named Mike Moray. Um, here's a picture. So this is all his work that I'll be talking about. We really should have had him uh, giving the talk. Mike is actually with us, hopefully, in the workshop so he can answer technical questions if any come up uh, at the end of the talk. So the goal of this talk is um, it actually builds on some very um, some, some very powerful and, and elegant work from um, Shui Shen Wei and Alan Stocker uh, from a few years ago. The motivating question for this work is, um, is to look at behavior, so psychophysical behavior in particular. So um, humans or other observers are given a psychophysical stimulus, and then they have to report what they see. And can we, on the basis of that behavioral data alone, make inferences about sensory representations in the brain? And so the cool thing about this way in Stocker uh, result was that they argued very, very powerfully that yes, we can uh, learn something um, very powerful about, about internal representations. And, um, and moreover, they proposed a new perceptual law, which I think is quite, uh, quite remarkable, um, that in 2017, we have new, new features of perceptual behavior being discovered that were not previously estimated. So let me start by giving you the intuition for what this perceptual law said, and then I'm going to um, tell you a bit, bit more about how, how our results build on top of it. So the, um, the perceptual law that was uh, formulated in Way and Stocker, this is a paper in, in PNAS in 2017, um, was about the relationship between um, a true stimulus and observers' bias and their um, and the discriminability of the stimulus. So if you think about a human here looking at the leaning tower of Pisa, um, theta would be the stimulus angle, the angle of that lean that the uh, that the true stimulus has. And you might imagine then that the subject has to report the um, the theta. Theta hat would be the observer's estimate of what that angle is. 
uh, that there could be two different aspects of those estimates that we might wish to, to, um, to interrogate. One is the systematic bias. So to what degree is theta hat systematically shifted away from the true theta, okay? That's bias. Discriminability, on the other hand, res relates more to the, the variability in these estimates. And in particular, it's asking how much would we have to vary theta, the true theta, in order to reliably detect that it had changed, okay? So, um, so in particular, the law that, um, that Wayne Stocker proposed was that bias, uh, the, the, how much systematic discrepancy there is between your estimate and the true theta is related to the derivative of discriminability squared. Okay, so it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around. I'm going to unpack that for you a, a bit more in a few slides. Um, but the, the, the very cool thing about this, this result was that um, they, they showed that this arises not, they didn't, they didn't find this by looking uh, at perceptual judgments. They found this by making derivations in terms of information theoretically optimal neural codes. So, um, so that's a bit of a teaser. And the, the structure for the talk will be as follows. I'm going to spend actually probably about two thirds to three quarters of my time trying to unpack this basic law, the Way and Stocker law um, that I just described to you briefly. So where does it come from? Um, you know, where is this relationship between bias and discriminability? Where does what, what does the derivation look like? What does it mean? And then secondly, what does what is the connection to information theory and efficient coding? In other words, what can it tell us about uh, how neurons encode uh, efficiently the external world? And then in the second part of the talk, I will um, briefly outline Mike's uh, very beautiful results on power law efficient codes that extend the basic framework from Way and Stocker. And we'll show that these more general class of power law efficient codes also give rise to the same, um, the same way and stocker perceptual law for any power. Okay, I'll, that'll become clear in the second half. Okay, so let's, let's start with the first part here. And I just wanna spend a little bit of time unpacking the basic law itself. So what does it mean to say that bias is related to the, to the derivative of squared discriminability? That's a lot to wrap your mind around. Okay, so I'm gonna try to unpack that for you. First of all, let's define bias. Okay, so bias, I said, Bias is, is defined as a function of the true stimulus theta, and it's equal to the true stimulus minus the average estimate of that, of that stimulus. So for example, if the leaning tower is, um, or let's say I present a series of leaning towers, and the true, whenever I present a stimulus which has five degree angle, and on average, I report it to have a seven degree angle, then I have a bias of minus two degrees, okay, right? So, so systematically, my estimates are off, this, this expected theta hat is the average of my estimates over multiple presentations of the stimulus. Um, and of course, we know, we, we know a lot about unbiased estimators. Uh, a lot of the classic uh, decision theory works with, with, um, with unbiased estimators, but we know that human observers typically are biased. Um, all right, so, so this is the, the definition of bias. Discriminability is a little bit harder to write down with a formula, so I'm gonna describe it with this um, a little bit more with words. It's the, it's the change in the stimulus such that I can, that I can discriminate that stimulus um, by, with, with a certain percent correct. So if alpha is, let's say I wanna get 75% correct, the delta will be the amount of change in the stimulus such that delta mi theta minus delta over two can be discriminated from delta plus theta over two with that, with that accuracy, right? So when, when um, so in other words, you get, this, is, this is also uh, known as the just noticeable difference or threshold. How far do I need to move theta in order to be reliably uh, able to say that it changed? Okay, so those that's that's the that's the basic the two terms involved in the in Stocker law. Let's now look at how it what what kind of quantitative predictions does it make? Specifically, what it's saying the way in Stocker law is saying that if I take discriminability, so this is some hypothetical task. Let's say theta is my stimulus here, and I have um, I have low discriminability at these uh, at these locations here, and high discriminability. Uh, sorry, high discriminability here means that I need it means it means high threshold. I need to move the stimulus a lot in order to notice a change. Whereas at these troughs here, I don't need to, I'm, I'm more sensitive. I don't need uh, to move the stimulus as much to notice a change. Um, what the Wayne Stocker law says is I should square the discrimin discriminability and take its derivative with respect to theta. So square and differentiate, and that will give me the predicted bias as a function of theta. So what this will say is that when I have discriminability with this, this two um, bump shape, my bias should systematically uh, had this sort of sinusoidal pattern here with with um, with also with two peaks, but notice that the location of the peaks of the bias are shifted with respect to the location of the uh, of, of uh, minimum discriminability. Okay, so this is quite a surprising finding. I don't think uh, 
maybe it's obvious to some of you, but it, but it um, certainly isn't something that I would have would have naturally just uh, just known to fall uh, to, to focus on. Um, but one of the remarkable things about the paper, before I go through the mathematical derivation and show you where this law comes from, I just want to show you some of the um, the empirical support for this law that they showed in their paper. And so this is, I think, one of the most impressive parts of the paper is that Way and Stalker mined the psychophysical li literature um, and they, they looked for different uh, signatures of threshold or discriminability. So green again is the threshold. They compute for this shape um, threshold function, right? So minimum threshold, most sensitivity at zero, minimal sensitivity at, um, at 180 degrees or pi. If I apply that way in Stalker law, I should get this sort of sinusoidal pattern of bias with a negative bias in, in the um, for negative angles and a positive bias for positive angles. And then they went into the psychophysical literature and found um, these are this is from Sweeney et al. 2012. Heading direction thresholds and measurements of the bias uh, agree with that same shape. Similarly, for motion direction, motion direction has ma um, maximum sensitivity at zero, and that we see biases. These are different papers here, even right. 1996. Um, Port Fors, Yeomans, Regan at 1996, and Welshman 2008 uh, was where the bias was reported. And they did this for a whole lot of other stimulus domains as well. Here's one, um, another kind of circular stimulus where the threshold has two bumps. Uh, the bias has this shape, and we see this for orientation and heading direction. I'll just zoom through a few others. Here's another one where the, the threshold has four bumps and the bias has this pattern. And you see, again, across a, a vast swath of the psychophysical literature, empirical support for the fact that the bias has this relationship to this relationship of proportionality to the pattern of the threshold or to the discriminability that we wouldn't have expected a priori, all right? It holds also for non-circular stimuli. So here's for a stimulus on the real line. Spatial frequency, again, threshold uh, is shown on the left, or this is discriminability. And on the right is shown the bias. And in every case, this um, this rule holds. It even holds in in, um, in places where, where it maybe even is more surprising, things like adaptation or temporal after effects. So the, t the tilt illusion um, the tilt illusion produces a distortion of, of a subject's threshold where they become slightly more sensitive near the adapter uh, and slightly uh, less sensitive on the flanks. And that we can see that that pattern of threshold change predicts this sort of wiggly shape of bias uh, change. And we, we see that again in the psychophysical data. So it's quite an extraordinary empirical validation of the model, uh, of, of the law, I should say, uh, that comes that comes from just, just on the basis of behavioral data alone. And, uh, you know, my hat is off to those uh, to those guys uh, and Alan for, for noticing this or for finding, going through the literature and finding the empirical support for it. So now let's, let's move to the theoretical side. So that, so far I just showed you a bunch of measurements of psychophysical observers performing threshold judgments and uh, making estimates to, to, to derive their bias. How does this relate to, um, what does this have to do with efficient coding or neural representations? Okay, so in order to understand that link uh, we need to consider the following model, which is an idealized, or sometimes people call this a, a Bayesian ideal observer model of how subjects perform psychophysical experiments. So the setup that, that we have in mind in these kinds of models is that there is some prior distribution governing the distribution of stimuli in the world. So we'll call this P of theta. This would be, so for example, uh, we know that the distribution of orientations has, a, uh, has, has a more orientations near the cardinal axis, so more vertical orientations and horizontal orientations than we have oblique orientations. So this prior will reflect that distorted um, distribution of stimuli in the real world. Um, and so what we have in mind is that on any, any particular uh, trial, a stimulus comes from this prior distribution and the observer, or we'll think of this as what's going on inside the brain, has an encoding model, P of R given theta, which describes how the observer it takes that stimulus and encodes it noisily into a neural response vector R, okay? So this is the important part. This is the encoder that will describe that mapping is captured by this conditional distribution P of R given theta. And of course, inside the brain, once you have that neural response, the observer is going to apply a decoder, F of R we'll call it, to produce their estimate theta hat, okay? So the connection to efficient coding, efficient coding tells us something about the relationship specifically between this encoding distribution P of R given theta and the prior. In particular, it tells us that the encoding model, model should allocate neural resources in a way that's optimal given the prior distribution, okay? And I'll, I'll unpack in a second what that means. Um, intuitively though, it would mean that if I have if I have a certain stimuli that I observe all the time, um, I might want to, uh, so for example, cardinal axes, uh, orientations, I might want to devote more, more neural resources to representing those cardinal axes because they come up all the time than I would to oblique axes uh, which are which are less common. And the limit of, of, a, of a feature that never occurs in the environment, I should not uh, allocate any resources to to um, to encoding it because it just doesn't come up, okay? 
So specifically, efficient coding, and, I, and here I mean the um, the classic Barlow notion that the, uh, the the brain should seek to maximize mutual information between theta, the stimulus, and R, the neural response, can be, um, we can find an approximate relationship in terms of Fisher information that will satisfy that, that um, optimality relationship. Specifically, if we take the Fisher information, which if you're not familiar with Fisher information, we can think of this as the neural resource that, we are, that we're allocating. It sets a bound on the decoding error. So the brain should allocate Fisher information in proportion to the prior squared. Okay, so if you think about that for a second, if I have a peaked prior like this Gaussian here, um, the prior squared means that the peak should be even higher and those tails will be even lower. So I should basically concentrate my neural resources near the peaks of the prior distribution and those tails of the prior, I should squash down even more, not devote very much, um, uh, very much, uh, uh, very many resources to them at all. And, I, and I'm, I'm skirting over the, I should say, there's a technical result that if I want to maximize, th this is the allocation of Fisher information that maximizes mutual information. Take all of these, there's the number of technical uh, con te technical conditions that need to be made, uh, need to be met in order for that relationship to be hold, to hold. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skirt those for the purposes of this talk. Okay, what does that actually look like to allocate Fisher information um, proportional to the prior squared. So in a, in a previous paper from Wayne Stocker, they actually considered this question in more detail. And they showed that you can actually, you can you can achieve this, alloc this unequal allocation of Fisher information, this unequal allocation of resources using uh, several, several different ways of doing it. So for example, if I have a prior distribution that looks like this, this is a little bit like the orientation prior, cardinal axes have a higher probability of, of having a stimulus, whereas the oblique axes have lower probability. I could achieve that um, in, in several different ways. One way would be to use unequally spaced tuning curves. So use um, more neurons whose, whose peak sensitivity is, um, is near, near the cardinal orientations. I could instead use unequal width tuning curves, so narrower tuning curves near the cardinal axes, or I could use unequal heights. So I could use um, tuning curves with larger maximal response, which have more, therefore carry more information near the cardinal, or, uh, cardinal axis. And what they showed was that any of these different strategies, as long as they allocate Fisher information according to this law at the bottom, they will, um, they will achieve this, this InfoMax property. Okay, so that's, that's so the, 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 the Way and Stocker law, that's one of the, of the fundamental components in the Way and Stocker 2017 law, which is that the Fisher information should be proportional to the prior distribution squared. Okay, we'll call this InfoMax allocation of F of Fisher information. That was that, that was also derived in an earlier paper from uh, from Deep Gamguli and Eros and Michelli in 2010. All right, there are two other uh, results from the prior literature, which I'm going to skip over. I'll just mention them very briefly. Uh, a 2009 paper from Peggy Serious showed that discriminability is bounded by one over the Fisher information to the to the, to the one half power, and then previous work from Wayne Stocker showed that bias can be related to the derivative of one over the prior squared. Okay. Um, and basically what I'll tell you is that if you just play a little bit of algebra with these three formulas on the, on the right, the way in Stocker law arises. Okay. You can see we've got bias down here in the third relationship. We've got Fisher information related to prior here, and we've got discriminability related to Fisher information. If you just uh, push through the numbers, that will, the, the, the way in Stocker law here, here will pop out. Okay. So it's kind of cool. The way in Stocker law, if you think about it, it doesn't say anything about neural resources explicitly. It talks about bias and discriminability, two perceptual qualities that we can measure in observers. But the link between them is in terms of Fisher information, which is this, this neural resource that we want to allocate optimally. Okay. And in particular, the, the Wayne Stocker paper was focused on this, this allocation where Fisher information was, was proportional to the prior squared. Okay. Our approach, let me now move to, to our contributions was to broaden, the, uh, broaden the, the class of efficient codes that we look at. So, so just to remind you, the, um, the Wayne Stocker approach paper assumed that Fisher information was allocated proportional to the prior squared. What we're going to assume instead is that the Fisher information is allocated proportional to a power law of the prior. So this is P of theta to the Q, that's taking the prior to the Qth power. And so notice that if Q is greater than one, then this is accentuating the peaks and smushing the tails. If on the other hand, Q is less than one, then we're effectively squashing the peaks and, and allocating more information to the tails. And I should say there's special cases. So this is a more, a more general class of efficient codes, which we'll call power law efficient coding. Um, and I should say, Previous literature has, has considered special cases of this, of this kind of code. In particular, 
And, I, and it includes the classic InfoMax efficient coding as a special case. So when Q equals two, of course, we, we uh, achieve the, the code I just mentioned, which maximizes mutual information between the stimulus and the response. On the other hand, Q equals 0.5 is a case um, that was first discussed in that, in that Ganguly paper called Discrimax, which maximizes discrimination performance or maximizes the percent correct at discriminating one stimulus from another. Um, and then more generally, we can, we can consider any Q less than or equal to two will achieve minimum LP norm, where, it, where, where the power of that P norm is related to two over Q minus one. It's, it's a bit technical. Anyway, these are different notions of optimality, um, which in other words, it says, it depends on what you want your code to do. Do you want it to be good at maximizing bits in the Shannon sense, or do you want it to be good at maximizing per, um, percent correct in discrimination, or do you want it to, to minimize some other loss function so that a, a power of the error between the estimate theta hat and theta, that would give you this more general family of minimum LP norms. And the, re the result from our paper, this is the main result from Murray and Pillow 2018, is that the, the way in Stocker law holds for the entire family of power law efficient codes. So namely, any code that has this form, Fisher information proportional to the prior to the qth power, has the same perceptual law that Wei and Stocker discovered, namely that bias is proportional to the derivative of squared discriminability. And more powerfully, um, we actually derived the constant of proportionality. So this is something that wasn't in the original paper. We showed that the proportionality constant between bias and discriminability um, depends on only two things. It depends on Q, the power that we raise uh, the prior to, and on D alpha here, which is which is basically the percent correct performance we want to in discriminability. So in other words, if we define discriminability to mean 95% correct versus 75% correct, that'll mean different values of alpha. So how, how far do I need to move the stimulus? Um, that will affect the size of the bias here. So so um, so those two factors, the notion of of, um, of D prime that I have in mind, how many how many units of D prime I consider to stimulate to be discriminable, and Q the power that gives us um, those two things together give us this proportionality constant for the more generalized way and stalker perceptual law. Okay, and here's just a simulated example to show you that it works even in non-information theoretic, not um, non-infomax settings. So, for example, if we set Q equal to one half. This is the in Discrimax setting where the code is allocated. This is actually allocating more information to the tails uh, relative to the prior than the, the maximum in, uh, mutual information code. So we're squashing the peaks of the prior and um, boosting up the tails of the prior. In that case, uh, so Mike generated this figure by generating some, some arbitrary smooth prior distributions from, from a Gaussian process. He then computed what, um, and, and then he allocated the Fisher information proportional to that prior raised to the qth power. Here he used Q equal one half, and he then computed um, the discriminability. This is the green curve here is the squared discriminability, the derivative of squared discriminability. And then our analytical formula gives you the, the blue trace here. Um, and when he did numerical simulations, um, you would obtain the black trace here. So you see that even for arbitrary shaped prior distributions, and I could show you a variety of other simulations with other powers of Q, the general relationship that the green curve here is proportional to bias with, I should say, note that the proportionality here is predicted by our formula, um, agrees very well with, uh, with the numerical results. Okay, um, and so, so that's the main result from, from our 2018 paper, and there are a number of other technical results in that paper that, I, that I, I think are a bit outside the scope of this talk. I wanna point you to one more of those technical results, although I won't discuss the details, and then I'll stop for questions, um, which is a more general, um, result about the notion of, of optimal codes. So I should say as background, that the way Stocker uh, law, and in particular the setup that they assumed uh, was that you maximize mutual information it, but via the following, uh, the following approach. So this is, this is saying we wanna maximize, th this term right here, the log of the Fisher information is an approximation to the mutual information. We wanna maximize this subject to the following constraint which is that this, the integral over the square root of the, of the Fisher information is constant. So in other words, I should say, in all cases of, of optimal coding, we have to have a constraint involved. If you can obviously have, if you can make your neurons have arbitrarily high signal to noise ratio, if they're not noisy at all, then there is no bias and we have 100% discriminability for any difference in stimulus. So there always has to be a limit on the capacity of the neural code and the capacity limit that they consider in their paper is this particular form that the integral over the square root of the Fisher information should be constant, okay? All right, 
And I'm just gonna say in words, it turns out that if you change this constraint, so instead of assuming a one half power on the Fisher information, if you use some, any other power, so J of X to the beta, um, meaning that we, we minimize the average, we, we keep a constraint, which is the average Fisher information raised to some other power beta, we, it turns out we get different optimal allocations of Fisher information uh, in that case. So even for Infomax, let's say I want Infomax subject to the integral of absolute value of Fisher information, I will no longer uh, have the same um, proportionality constant. So I will no longer have a power of two. Fisher information proportional to prior raised to the power two to maximize mutual information. Um, so so, um, so, so, so the, the details are technical and they're in the paper. So I'll refer you to the 2018 paper if you want to know more. But basically the, the take home conclusion is that the, the, the assumption about what constraint the brain is subject to when the designing the code also interacts with the power of the power law efficient code and the notion of optimality, whether it's Infomax optimality or LP norm or some other notion of optimality. Those things are all bound up. Okay, so let me just uh, summarize and then uh, I'll, I'll stop for questions. Um, I introduced power law efficient codes. These are codes in which the Fisher information is proportional to the prior distribution raised to some power Q. And they generalize classic Infomax codes, which are a special case when that power Q equals two, okay? Um, and then we showed that these power law efficient codes are consistent with the power law efficient coding, um, sorry, power law efficient coding is consistent with the way Stalker law um, for any power Q. In other words, the fact that we observe this correspondence between um, bias and discriminability in, in, in uh, psychophysical data does not mean that the brain must be using an Infomax code, it may not be using allocating Fisher information um, in order to maximize mutual information. It may be allocating uh, Fisher information uh, consistent with any other kind of loss function, LP norm or Discromax that you might that you might want. All of those different uh, optimal allocations of information will give rise to the same perceptual law. We derived the constant of proportionality for that law. And then lastly, as I mentioned at the end, we showed that there are uh, complex relationships between optimality, the constraint that you assume, and the loss function. And in particular, Infomax codes where Q e the power of Q equals two are not necessarily Infomax if we make a different assumption about what's really limiting neural capacity. And I should say limits on neural capacity are something that we want to investigate more um, in terms of the, of the energetic cost or the metabolic costs that, that are placed on the brain under evolution or under the operating regime that it operates. So this is, this is something that we could, we could think about doing um, serious um, empirical or theoretical work to try to pin down what are the true sources of constraints on, on, uh, on coding that would allow us to to, to uh, unpack this further. Okay, um, some future directions to think about. We can identify, so, so Mike showed that the law holds for any power Q, but now that we have the exact, um, we can predict the proportionality constant between bias and discriminability, we could go look at those psychophysical data and try to identify what power Q is consistent with, uh, with observers' results. Um, there's also some, some uh, a relationship to anti-Bayesian percepts where we can predict whether the subject will um, their biases will be toward the peaks of the prior or away from the peaks of the prior that result from this ability. Um, and then finally, I should say as a huge caveat to the entire talk, all of these results relied on Fisher information, which assumes that we are in a high signal to noise ratio where, where the, the posterior distribution over the stimulus given the neural response is approximately Gaussian. All right. And so there would be cases in, in say the low signal to noise where we have low contrast or, or dim lighting conditions where, where the Fisher information approximation to mutual information breaks down. And it would be interesting to think about other methods that we could use in that setting. Um, and the general outlook I think is quite optimistic. Um, we've seen that there's, there's a powerful framework for relating um, perceptual data back to the underlying neural codes that gave rise to them. Although it's complex as there are multiple knobs to tune that we have. Uh, at our disposal. All right, so with that, I'd like to just thank, um, thank Mike for, um, for a beautiful work, uh, piece of work that he, that, he, uh, that he achieved in this, uh, in this paper and to thank our funding sources. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and take questions. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'm checking for questions. Please feel free to drop a message in the chat or the ask a question box. Uh, I, can, I can start with, by asking a question. So how, how is the, the prior, the P, of theta learned. It seems to me that it should encapsulate some uh, uh, information about the internal intrinsic noise that relates maybe to discriminability and also sensory noise or sensory uncertainty. Or, uh, I mean, you talked about you know information breaking down if noise is, uh, is yes. it seems. So how do we pick 
P of theta, let's to put it simply. Great, so that's a great question. So, so one approach, what you might call the objective approach, is to go and measure the prior um, from, from natural, natural scenes. So this is from, um, let's see, this is a paper by, um, also from, from, uh, from Eros and Michelli's group, that um, they went into took natural scene data and then they took local statistics and they computed the prior in each local image factor. Here the little red lines indicate areas where there was a strong edge present with a particular orientation. And then they just made a histogram of those orientations. And this is consistent with what I said, that we see more uh, orientations at 90 degrees, so horizontal or 180 degrees vertical than you, would, than you get at 45 degrees or 135 degrees. So one approach is to, yeah, to go out into the world and measure the prior, I, I should say, the, the way in Stalker, uh, the, the results from Wayne Stocker didn't rely on any measurement of the prior. All they did was show that, oh, sorry. Yeah, that, that um, in, the, in the psychophysical literature, we have this relationship. Um, so they didn't ultimately relate these threshold measurements and bias back to a prior, but we could do so if we, um, if we, if we go measure it from natural scenes. The other approach, of course, is one that, that I've taken in some of my previous work, and so has, has Alan and, and Zhui Jin, uh, which is to take subjects observer uh, uh, to take what subjects actually reported and to try to infer what prior they were using. So this is often known as prior elicitation. So we can say, if we assume that subjects are trying to minimize mean squared error, um, so, they, so they're, they're, they're allocating their resources in order to minimize mean squared error, and they have a loss function that they're trying to minimize, which is, which is this, um, this squared error, then we can take the distribution of their estimates and back out what prior they were effectively using. And this is often known as the subjective approach, where we didn't, we can now look at whether that prior that the subject seemed to be using matches the one in the real world. One way to, to explain for it, what looks like irrational behavior in that case would be to say, well, the subjects are behaving rationally or they're behaving Bayes optimally as though they had some other prior in their head that doesn't match what's in the world. So there are these two approaches uh, that, that we could take, either to measure priors objectively from, from real world scenes or to, um, or to attempt to infer priors from subjects' behavior, and I think there are, there are strengths and weaknesses to both both uh, both approaches there. But that's that's I think another interesting direction for future work. I see. I, I should say because the prior you infer using those subjective methods depends a bit on what you assume about what the subject is optimizing. So if you assume the subject is doing discramax coding, um, you will get a different inferred prior than if you assume the subject is doing infomax coding. So that's 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 like one complication um, to, to trying to infer the priors. You have to make assumptions about about the subject's loss function. I see. So it seems to me also that um, when comparing to psychophysical data, there are two things in a sense that, or uh, two degrees of freedom to put it that way. One is the loss function used, like the, the Q exponent, and the other is the constraint of, you know, regarding neural resources. So it seems to me that there can be different combinations that would yield similar predictions or, or not, or how That's do we that right. That's, yeah, You nailed it. Yes. In fact, there's a formula from the paper that Mike uh, wrote that I didn't put into the slide because it was too complex for me to even try to read it. But if you if you think about um, yeah, if you look at this, the general approach that Mike, uh, the general formula that Mike derived, let me see if I can just sketch it for you. So yeah, so this is, um, this is the, this here is the, the setup used in Way and Stalker, which is that they assume you're trying to maximize this term over here, which is the approximate mutual information uh, subject to this constraint. If you replace log of J of theta by, um, by the determinant of J of, J of X to the, Alpha to the beta power, so you basically have one power, uh, an exponent here and another exponent here. The two of those things uniquely determine a code. Okay, so the power Q can be related to any 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 trade-off between that alpha and beta will determine your optimal Q. So so um so there's a very nice general um it's a generalization of the kramer rao bound that Mike derived that allows us to relate what you're maximizing. So this would be related to your loss function and your constraint. And as long as those both have a power law form, something to, and I should say this log is the extreme version of a power law and the limit of the power goes to zero. You get, you get back something that's still within this family of power law efficient codes, which lead to a unique value of Q. Okay, but you're right though, that for a particular value of Q, there are two, there, there's an infinite number of ways you could have gotten it by changing your constraint and changing your, your loss function. So there's a, there's a complete uncertainty about which of the, how those two ingredients combined to give you the Q that you measured uh, from your subject. Um, so, so yeah, so we need more empirical data to, to, to basically think about either what's the neural constraint or to think about maybe what the loss function is. There's also been some work, uh, I can think of some in particular from Conrad's Curtin's group with a pea shooter where they tried to infer what the subject's loss function was from data. So I think, yeah, we would need more empirical work 
to really try to nail down how those two pieces, the loss and the constraint, work together to determine an optimal code. Yeah, yeah, great talk, and thanks for, for the answers. I thanks think so much for the questions. Can, yeah, thanks so much. And we can uh, move on with uh, the next speaker in a couple of minutes. So we take a small break, and I'll call Vijay uh, on screen, who might, yeah, will say bye to Jonathan. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Yeah, so. So it's a pleasure uh, to have uh, Professor Vijay Balasubramanian from UPenn. He's a professor of physics. So we'll hear more uh, exciting stuff on information theory and uh, connections to statistical physics from my, uh, from my perspective, as well as uh, having a degree in physics, first degree in physics. Uh, so uh, let's say, yeah, we're about on time. Let's take, uh, let's wait for a minute. Okay. I'll take a breath and yeah, let's start in a minute. Could you remind me how, once again, I connect the screen? Absolutely. So you basically, you can share your screen uh, by going above your face. Okay. And you okay. will see the buttons. And then there is a button that has a, a screen and arrow. And Perfect. yeah. So I guess we can start. Uh, thanks so much, Vijay. And we look forward to listening to your talk on complexity information and intuitive model selection. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference. Uh, it would be even nicer if we were all together. But you know, uh, this is uh, fun, too. And uh, thanks, in particular, to the organizers for putting this all together. So indeed, I'm going to talk about complexity, information, and intuitive model selection. And this is joint work currently in preparation with a brilliant postdoc, Eugenio Piacini, uh, who's at the Computational Neuroscience Initiative at Penn, and with Josh Gold, my colleague at Penn. Great. So, all right. So, you know, so animals acting in the world um, constantly need knowledge of the latent states of the world. So this is important for prediction, for planning, and for action. In, um, we're really ultimately in, uh, interested in the underlying causes that are producing the phenomena around us. And for that, you need to know something about how to infer them. So this inference, unfortunately, is always being done from noisy and uncertain cues. The data that we get is not always correct. It's a little bit off uh, sometimes. And what's more, the world is changing constantly. Right, so the uh, the underlying source of the information may change, and our mental and our mental models must be updated constantly to keep track of all of this in order for us to act well. Now, um, the mental model that we keep of the world can be explicit, as in you know you can write it down in equations, for example, on a piece of paper, and uh, or it can be implicit. We may not even know. In fact, typically when we act, we don't know what our mental model is. And the reasoning required to then infer that model can either be formal, if you can write it down, so to speak, or intuitive in the sense that you don't actually know what you're doing, but you're doing it. But regardless, it requires effort like the individual over here on the left um, uh, who is you know, working very hard to build some implicit model of the world. Now, so what does theory say for how we should go about doing this kind of thing? So. Well, so consider the example on the left. You have an x-axis and a y-axis. There's a bunch of data. Those are the black points that have been produced. And you could ask, what is your model for where that data came from, abstractly? And clearly, many models are possible. You could suppose that all of this data came from this line, the blue line. You could suppose that it came from this quadratic curve, the green curve, or through this very wiggly thing that goes through every single point. And clearly, the red line, the very wiggly you know, degree n, pol n minus 1 polynomial, fits all the data perfectly well. So normally, you might think that uh, uh, if you make some observations in the world, the way in which you, the best way, the best way somehow to build your internal model is to use some very complex algorithm to extract and process all the information possible in the data, possibly to fit it as well as you can. And so on. that's what we'd normally, you might think. But in fact, that's not clear. So this gentleman here is William of Ockham. Uh, he was a 12th century scholastic philosopher in the time when people were debating, you know, the causes of things in the world, and particularly the attributes of God. And you know, he proceeded to 
uh, he had this aphorism, causes should not be multiplied beyond necessity, meaning you should not make your internal model, we take this to mean today in modern science, that we should not try to make your model of the world unnecessarily complex. So, but why, right? What's the problem with having complicated models of the world? Well, one problem is that when data is sparse or noisy, in fact, very often less complex models of that data give better predictions. And this could be because when the data is noisy or sparse, you know, it's very difficult to fit a very complex model and you may not get the model right. Or it may be that you fit the noise and therefore you extrapolate from noise and, <clears throat> and get less good predictions. So that's one reason why it can be the case that less complex <clears throat> and possibly less correct models, namely the truth may be complex, but you may have a less complex model because you basically can't infer this complex truth. Another reason why less complex models can be better sometimes or could be better is they can also be more expensive. So computationally and cognitively, it can be expensive to build, maintain, infer, and reason with more complex models. So there are constraints on that kind of expense. And it may well be that because of that, there's some sort of law of diminishing returns, and therefore you should have simpler models. So today, I'm basically going to have time to talk about uh, point number one. And um, at the end, I'll mention something about the second point, about the sort of expense of complex models. So in the first thing where, you know, uh, concerning the first point, where when data is sparse or noisy, sometimes less complex models are better, you know, we know many techniques that people have invented over the years for thinking about how you pick, how you trade off the accuracy and complexity of your model of data. So famously, there's the AIC model in which you minimize the log likelihood, uh, the log maximum likelihood. So theta hat is the maximum likelihood parameter. E here are the data you see and M is your model. So you minimize the minus log, uh, ma minus log maximum likelihood plus the number of parameters. And so you pick whichever model minimizes that quantity and you say that's the one you're gonna pick. And you see the number of parameters here is a complexity penalty. Now, another sort of model uh, uh, model selection criterion that people have used is the B BIC, the Bayesian Information Criterion, where people minimize minus log maximum likelihood, same quantity again, and then half the number of parameters. And these two criteria, uh, uh, this is so half the number of parameters is also a, uh, you know, a uh, complexity penalty. And this is, uh, these two kinds of criteria come from slightly different uh, uh, choices for what you want to do, uh, what, uh, you know, wh what target you want to achieve in your inference. So more generally, you know, suppose you decide that instead of picking an ad hoc criterion, what you want to do is optimal probabilistic model selection. So you might think that the best thing you could possibly do is you gather all the data. So that's you have a data set consisting of n data points, E1 through En. And uh, what you're going to do, let's suppose, is just use all of the data optimally. You know, probability theory is going to tell you what the best you can do with this is. It's going to tell you, suppose you have, let's say, a model family A, that's this line here and a model family B, that's the surface here. So each model family contains many models in it, depending upon how you choose the parameters. So you might suppose, uh, and let's suppose the truth, the, uh, the generative distribution, the, the, the model generating the distribution is this model T here. And you're gonna to try to describe the data generated from T by using either a, a model in A or model in B. Well, you might suppose that the best thing to do is you want to evaluate Given this data, what is the probability that the ge data generate, uh, was generated by the family A versus the family B? So you want to compute probability of A given the data E or probability of B given the data E. And, you know, so optimal probabilistic model selection would say pick whichever one is most likely, for example, right? You could, uh, you could pick that as a criteria. So, you know, uh, so we know from Bayes' law that the probability, the posterior probability of the model family A given the data E is equal to the likelihood, the probability that E, the data was generated by A, times a ratio of priors, the prob prior probability of the model A divided by the prior probability of the data, and similarly for the model B. So conventionally, you know, if we were going to do model selection, if you don't know anything, if all else is equal, um, we might take the probability of A, the model A and the model B to be equal. And you know, if you know something about why A is more likely than B, then of course you should put it in. And then having put that in, suppose you take model families to be equally likely, then you know, maximizing the posterior probability, the probability of A or B given the data is equivalent to selecting 
uh, based upon the likelihood. So in other words, you can select the model A if the likelihood that A generated the data is greater than the likelihood that, a, that B generated the data. Now the next step, if you're going to do probabilistic model selection, is you need to calculate these likelihoods, the probability that the data might have been generated from A. The way you go about doing that is, well, of course, suppose I'm talking about the model family A, there are many models in A. Each model is parameterized by different choice of parameters here called theta. Let's suppose there are D parameters, so then the Bayesian approach here is you would take a prior probability over the parameters, that's this W of theta, and then integrate up the total probability uh, um, integrate that up uh, by saying that you're going to take the integral of the parameter space of the prior probability of the parameters times the probability that the data was generated by the particular model with the parameters theta. So you do this integral, and that tells you the probability that the model family A generated the data that you know was in fact generated from some other distribution t. So the next question, the next choice that the model selector has to do, right, is to choose a prior. So suppose you know what the, uh, you know, if you know something about the parameters theta, so for example, like in Jonathan's talk, if there's a prior you've learned on the world by sort of observing it in the past, then you should use it. Right? And these priors make a difference. But for the moment, suppose you know nothing, let's say, then you may want to choose an uninformative prior where you basically weight all the distributions in this model family equally. So every individual distribution weight equally, and that you do by using something called the, um, uh, by using this prior. So Jij here in this expression is the Fisher information that Jonathan also referred to in the previous talk. So what's the Fisher information? Well, you compute the probability that the data that you, uh, that some data was generated by the, uh, by the model with parameters theta. You take the log of it, so you take the log likelihood, and then you take this second derivative. So you deri differentiate with respect to parameter i and parameter j, and then you take an expectation value at that particular parameter value theta. So this quantity is called a Fisher information. And it has been shown uh, by a variety of people that the uninformative prior, namely the prior distribution on parameter space that weights all, uh, all probability distributions in the model equally, is this thing here where you take the square root of the determinant of the Fisher information, and then you normalize it. So this thing in the denominator is simply the integral of the numerator, so it basically normalizes it so that the prior, uh, so that the prior distribution of our parameters integrates to one. Okay, so given the setup, so this is what you're supposed to do if you want to do optimal probabilistic model selection. So you can approximate this in the following way. So we're going to imagine that you have a reasonable amount of data, so n, the number of data points is, re is reasonably large. And it was shown in this paper some time ago now that you can now approximate this sort of Bayesian expression the, the, that, uh, that gives you optimal probabilistic model selection in the following way. If you want to compute the log likelihood of the data E, then there's, a C, there's an expansion of the following kind. The log likelihood of the data is equal to minus the log likelihood of the uh, ma minus the log maximum likelihood. So namely, so if you want to compute the log of the likelihood the data is produced by model family A, you first find the maximum likelihood parameter that maximizes this likelihood, and you compute the minus log likelihood there. So that's the first term. Then you take half the number of parameters times the logarithm of the number of data points over 2 pi. So this is a penalty on the number of parameters, on the, on the dimensionality of the model. And then uh, uh, that is a term that already appears in the BIC. We discussed that earlier. So, but then if you take the full Bayesian or probabilistic expression, expression from the probability of the data given the model family A, there are additional terms that are, are usually ignored. So the next couple of terms that appear is a penalty uh, for the volume of the model in some sense. So what happens is that there's a penalty that's a log of the integral of the square root of the determinant of the Fisher information across the entire model space. So what does this penalize? This term penalizes models that are, um, uh, that are not constrained. So the bigger this volume, if you like, in the space of models, the more the different worlds your model is describing, so the less constrained and precise it is. So this is a penalty that's prescribed by probability theory for models that are not uh, constrained. 
the next term in the series looks like one half the determinant, uh, the logarithm of the determinant of the empirical Fisher information. The empirical Fisher information is a Fisher information computed from the distribution of the actual data. And that's divided by the determinant of the Fisher information of the model, where you compute the Fisher information on the parametric space of the model itself. So one is taking the empirical distribution, and the other Fisher information is computed, oops, uh, using the uh, distribution specified by a model family. And actually, there's some additional terms involving boundaries, the model space, et cetera, but I'm not putting those down here. So anyway, so this is a, in principle, a somewhat complicated expression, but what it does is, let's look at this. So the first term here um, rewards a model for having a good maximum likelihood parameter. Namely, if you come close to the truth, it rewards the model. The second model, the second term, penalizes models that are high dimensional. That makes sense as a punishment for complexity, right? The third term penalizes unconstrained models. That also makes sense as a complexity penalty. And the fourth term actually turns out to be penalizing a lack of robustness. You can understand this like this. So suppose you consider these two model families, right, A and B, and here's the truth T. Now, both of these models, A and B, sort of come equally close to the truths. In fact, B comes a little bit closer. But you can see that B, the parameters of B, B will be less robust as a model of T, because if you fiddle the parameters at the maximum likelihood point right here just a little bit, you'll rapidly go away from the truth. Whereas in model A, if you fiddle the parameters a little bit, you will stay close to the truth. So A is more robust as a model of the data than B. So this last term here actually rewards models that are more robust and penalizes models that are less robust. So all of this gives a very clear geometric interpretation of complexity. And although I didn't derive it that way here, you get very similar results from it with an information theory interpretation from using the minimum description length principle of Jorma Rissanen, uh, the predictive information approaches of Bill Bialik. So all of these things produce, in addition to the log likelihood and the penalty for the dimension of the parameter space, they produce these additional penalties for, uh, for model volume, for robustness, and for boundaries in the model space that have been, have been ignored so far in most work. Great. So then, in this language, you know, if I compute the, uh, the, the likelihood, the log likelihood of a, the data given some model family, it consists of you know, multiple terms. There's a likelihood, there's the penalty for the dimension, for the volume, for the, uh, for the robustness, and so on. And if I take two models, this red model and this green model here as models of, let's say, this truth, this blue point, you'll get two different expressions. And then the way you work out which one to pick is you basically should take the ratio of the probability of E given M1 and the sum of the probability of E given M2 and M1. And so you'll get this criterion in the end of the day, the chance that you should really, uh, the data was generated from M1 rather than M2 will be given if you massage all the expressions together by something that looks like this, one over one plus E to the L1 minus L2, that's the log likelihood terms. D1 minus D2, that's the dimension penalty, and so on. So there's a criterion you can write down for how you should select between models. OK, great. So that's the theory. And that sets out in complete detail what you should do if you're selecting between two model families uh, using optimal probabilistic model selection. But what do people do? So all of this says that you know there should be when you don't have very much data there should be if you were doing things you know something approaching optimally you should be having a bias towards what we would uh, what we would tend to call simplicity of a model so you could ask the question do people actually when they do intuitive model selection prefer simpler explanations is there some actual evidence that you prefer simpler explanations and if they do how do they trade off simplicity and goodness of fit and then how does simplic human simplicity bias, if any, compare to the optimum, uh, optimum bias predicted by probability theory? So in the remaining time, I'm going to show you results from a series of experiments that uh, we're writing up right now, uh, uh, testing for such uh, simplicity biases. So here's the task. So you know the, uh, our subjects are told that uh, here are two flower beds. Here's a big flower bed and a small flower bed. Okay, and they may be sometimes flip them so that the small flower bed is on top and the big flower bed is on top or at the bottom. One of them happens to have a flower and it drops 10 seeds and those are the red dots. 
and the seeds get dropped in the Gaussian distribution with a fixed variance, and the variance is about the distance between these two lines. Right? Now, the flower may be anywhere in the bed with equal probability. So the flower may be here, or here, or here, or here, or here. And so here's the question, which bed has the flower? So that's the task we're going to pose to the subject. Okay? And we have four types of trials. In one, the, the first flower bed is this little dot here. And the second flower bed is this long one here. So here, there's a, the two models if you that you might have of the world, that the world is a, that the flowers inside the dot or the flowers inside this uh, line, differ in model dimension. The second example involves this flower bed and this flower bed. And in that case, uh, you see there's some penalties involving the boundary. These two are chosen to have the same volume, for example. So there's no difference in the volume penalty in, in the Bayesian model selection. Here, there's a big flower bed and a small flower bed. So this one has a larger model volume. And Vijay, I can't see your, your cursor, just for you to know. I'm not sure I can see your cursor. Oh, really? But I can see it in my screen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, I... just be aware that it might not be visible to everyone. Ah, that is a problem, because I've been pointing at lots of stuff so far. Yeah, here is more crucial, I guess. But it's, it's, it's fine. I think, uh, yeah. OK, so now that I know that uh, you can't see this, but I, uh, I've now I'm now talking about the third uh, uh, type of trial on the top. So if you look at the model volume trial, you'll see that one is uh, one, uh, uh, you know, one flower bed, if you like, is bigger than the other. So one model has a lot of the world that the flower lies along the bigger line has a bigger model volume than the other. And on the right side, you see a, um, um, uh, you see, a uh, 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 to, uh, to, uh, uh, you know one flower bed if you like that's curved and one that's flat and as a result um, one provides a more um, uh, the, the robustness term that I mentioned earlier in the uh, complexity penalties uh, 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 differs between these two models. Okay, so we assign fifty subjects to each of these task types, and before the experiment, each subject goes through a tutorial. And then each subject has two interactive practice sessions, about 20 trials each. And then they each participate in about 500 trials of their task type. So in the end, they're asked to sort of classify this, uh, you know, as to which, uh, where the, uh, the flower was located. And then we try to see, and then we compare with the predictions from the uh, Bayesian theory. OK, so let's look at this now. So how do we quantify the predicted bias towards simplicity? So this is what we do. So suppose the empirical distribution of seeds has a sample mean at a given location. So if you look at the upper plot here, there's the wide line and there's the narrow line. So the flower may be in the bigger line over there or at the top or the uh, smaller line. Now, suppose that the empirical distribution of the seeds has a mean that lies somewhere in that rectangle. So depending upon where that empirical, uh, that sample mean is, uh, different model selection algorithms will either decide that the flower lies in the upper bed or in the lower bed. So in particular, if you have a, uh, uh, um, if you use maximum likelihood model selection, then um, the uh, model would, uh, maximum likelihood uh, model selection would predict the upper model, the longer line, if the empirical mean lies closer to the upper line than to the lower, uh, than to the lower flower bed. So that's the blue curve in the in the upper figure. Uh, by the way, do you think if I instead shared my um, whole screen instead of just this uh, window, you'd be able to see my cursor? We can try. Okay, let me just try to do that. How do I do this? Uh, let me stop sharing, and then I'm going to try resharing. Uh, share screen again, and this time I'm going to share my entire screen. Share. And OK, so now I am sharing my entire screen, but I need to bring up my, my uh, keynote. OK, can you announce uh, my uh, course? No, no, we, we're not, you're not sharing at least uh, your screen. Unfortunately, maybe you have to click again on this uh, arrow inside the screen. And... OK, there we go. Because you can see me in, uh, you know, Full size. Is this so, working? Yeah. How yes. about now? And can you see my cursor? Yes, now we can see that. Aha. Uh -huh. So the key is not to share a window, but to share the whole screen. 
thanks for yeah for letting us know. Okay, great. So for the next speaker, that'll help. Great. Now great. I can use thanks the torch. So I am so happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Here we go. Okay, so so you see, um, if you do maximum likelihood model selection, then you'll pick whichever model lies closer to the sample mean. So this blue line is the sort of threshold. If the sample mean lies below the, the blue line, you'll pick the lower model. And if the sample mean lies above the blue line, you'll pick the upper model. But the Bayesian model selection uh, procedure uh, uh, penalizes complexity. Namely, it penalizes, uh, in this case, the volume of the model. It prefers more constrained models that are therefore simpler in that sense. And as a result, the Bayesian model selection requires a high, oh, oh I, sorry, the maximum likelihood model is the red one. Uh, it's the red one over here. And then the Bayesian model selection uh, requires a higher sample mean in order for you to select the upper model because there's a penalty for complexity. Okay, so we can quantify that in the following way. I'm going to take this line, this midpoint, this midline over here, and I'm going to ask as you go from if the sample mean lies down here all the way up to up here, which model should you select? And so if you write down the probability of that you should pick uh, that of the model uh, the, of the lower model given the data, you see the maximum likelihood model selection procedure. Uh, goes through this curve. So when the vertical when the sample mean is at uh, 0.5, you know, halfway up, you'll find that uh, that's when the maximum likelihood model selection switches between saying that the up lower model is more likely versus the upper model is more likely. Okay. Whereas the Bayesian model is shifted over to the right. So we're going to call the simplicity bias for the purposes of this talk the shift in where in what the switchover is between picking the lower model and the higher model. And you can do this, you can compute the simplicity bias for each of the four tasks. So this is the task where you have a, uh, you know, one flower bed is a line, the other one is this little circle, one uh, in, so, so there's difference in the robustness of these two models of the data. And then here you have two models that differ in their volume. These are two models that differ in their dimension. And these are two models that differ in various ways, including their boundary terms. And you can see different kinds of simplicity biases, the amount of shift between left and right, Right between the where you cross over, the crossover between picking the upper or the lower model happens for the maximum likelihood versus the base is what we'll call a simplicity bias. So great. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the simplicity bias for uh, in humans, namely uh, how likely are you to pick the upper model versus the lower model. And here's what we find. So this is a somewhat complicated figure, so let's walk through it step by step. I'm actually going to go through it perhaps backward because this one is easiest to understand. So if you start with a task where you have the horizontal flower bed and the vertical flower bed, then um, the maximum likelihood model is going to have zero uh, simplicity bias because you know uh, it's going to pick whichever, uh, whatever the data says is more likely. So you have a bunch of uh, uh, seeds that come up, and you're going to guess from that where the uh, where the uh, flower was, and the maximum likelihood by uh, model is defined as the one that has no bias towards simplicity. So you pick just the most likely thing. But then, if you look at what the Bayesian model predicts, the Bayesian model selection predicts that you should have about a 25% simplicity bias. That is to say, relative to the threshold of where you pick the verdict of the upper or the lower model. Um, that should be 25% bias in the uh, uh, um, uh, if you were doing things sort of optimally Bayesian in a Bayesian way, and the biases that you see in different individual humans uh, lie in this uh, histogram in this uh, distribution over here. So, so basically uh, matches what uh, the simplicity bias suggested the Bayes very very accurately. Now, if you consider the model dimension, for example, again the maximum likelihood is no simplicity bias. The Bayesian uh, model selection says you should have like you know close to a 10% simplicity bias, but actually many people have an even bigger simplicity bias than Bayes would suggest. That is to say, they really prefer the simpler model in the sense that tend to go for the point, even if uh, much more often than, uh, or they seem to be much more biased towards the simple model, uh, towards the uh, lower dimensional model. Here you have the term. Uh, uh, this experiment was designed to probe the penalty for the volume of the model. Less constrained models are more complex and therefore should be less preferred. And again, you know, the maximum likelihood model has zero simplicity bias. Uh, the Bayesian approach would suggest uh, you should optimally have about a 20% simplicity bias. And what people show is a distribution that's around 10 to 15%. And finally, there's this robustness uh, uh, bias, 
that you should uh, that the Bayesian theory suggests that you should have, and you do have some, but it's not as much as predicted by the Bayesian by the Bayesian analysis. So overall, what we see is humans are biased towards simple models in this sense. They're biased in the direction that's suggested by the Bayesian analysis of the trade-off between simplicity and accuracy of models. In some cases, the bias matches quantitatively the, uh, the Bayesian analysis. In some cases, it's more. In some cases, it's less, but it's definitely in the direction of picking simpler models. So um, that's it. So uh, what did we say today? So a couple of things. So one is uh, I tried to show you that probability theory has a built-in Occam's razor such that simpler models are preferred until there is enough data. And both Bayesian theory and information theory both predict very specific penalties for complexity. They specify how you should trade off accuracy and simplicity. We then showed uh, using data that you know this is the first time this is the first public outing of this data uh, that uh, that we've gathered uh, that humans have a systematic bias towards simpler models and away from the maximum likelihood choice and that this bias reflects the Bayesian prediction. Now, there's one more thing that we talked about at the very beginning that even if the more complex models give better predictions, there may be reasons why you don't want to use them basically because the cognitive and computational costs grow too rapidly, so um, creating some sort of law of diminishing returns. So we have a bunch of results on that too. Uh, there's uh, some joint work with Gaia Tavoni, uh, who's going to becoming an assistant professor at Washington University, St. Louis this fall, and Josh Gold about this. And we have a bunch of data on human inference quantitatively reflecting that trade-off between the actual complexity, the algorithmic complexity of you know, implementing and running a model um, uh, as opposed to the accuracy. So overall, um, there seems to be indeed a human simplicity bias, and um, uh, possibly for two reasons. One, because you know that's what's predicted for probability theory. You should bias yourself towards simpler models. There, uh, they can be more accurate as predictors. And secondly, because um, uh, their more complex models are harder to work with. Okay, I will stop there. That's it. Yeah, thanks so much, Vijay, for this enlightening talk. Uh, it's very nice to see how it all fits together also in the context of the previous uh, notions and uh, ideas that we heard from Jonathan. It's a great talk. And I think we have one or two questions from uh, Randy, and I have a question of my own. So, Randy, I'm not sure if you want to come on screen. I could try to invite you. Let's try to do that. And maybe if it doesn't work, I will ask the question. Sure. About the amount of data. Yeah. Randy is coming, it's popping. Should be right. Mouse thing, but uh, just remember to tell the other speakers that they should just share the whole screen and that will work out fine. Sure. Hi, Randy. Good to see you. Hi. Uh, let's unmute Randy, I think. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I have the first. Oh, uh, he's muted. Ah, Randy, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, now I can hear you. No? Yes, yes. Okay, a great talk. We're off to a wonderful start here. Um, I'm a fan of Ristinen's uh, minimum description length approach because it has this wonderful property. Uh, I work on these animal learning experiments, and of course, when the animal starts, it has practically no data. And uh, the Ristinen has this absolutely natural property that uh, when you have very little data, you have a you have a simple model. You don't have to think in a way about what prior you should uh, uh, use. Um, and I wondered whether in your experiments, it might not be the case that the extent to which you see a bias towards simplicity depends upon the amount of data that the subject has in a given case. Have you investigated that? So that will absolutely be the case. So I have several comments. So the first thing, uh, the first comment is that Ruthman's approach uh, to this is a, uh, uh, one of the interesting outcomes of some of this analysis is that it's exactly parallel to the Bayesian approach. So if you take the Bayesian expansion that uh, I was giving, that gives you exactly the same thing as in the MDL approach. There's one additional term that comes out in the Bayesian analysis, which is this robustness term. And that's because um, Ristinen mm -hmm. is uh, uh, you know, philosophically, uh, perhaps correctly, doesn't believe in the existence of the true distribution. 
So in some sense, there's a uh, in many of his analyses, he assumes right. that the distribution lives in the family, right? But uh, but uh, so the additional term uh, that so one of the reasons why this work is interesting, I believe, is because there's additional components to the complexity that are not included in MDL for that for that technical reason. It would be there, to be included, but it's exactly parallel. So I agree with you completely that the purpose of these kind of expansions and analysis is to understand what happens when you don't have much data. Real life involves working with very little data. You, know, you have to make judgments very quickly. And I agree with you that, uh, indeed, it will be the case. Uh, the expression explicitly shows that the simplicity bias should be greater when you have less data. We have not investigated this uh, systematically. Uh, basically because, you know, um, uh, well, yeah, you know, the usual difficulty of data gathering, we've got a certain amount of data, we've got a certain number of observers, and we've done the experiment. One of the things in the agenda is indeed to ask questions about either setting up the experiment or limiting the amount of data that the uh, observers have in such a way that increases or decreases their simplicity bias. What would be really great is to actually see a parametric dependence on the amount of data. You know, the, the theory predicts particular parametric dependences. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, Right, so the dimension, uh, the, uh, yes. the dimension, yes, is because the have enough predictions, you should move to a less simple model uh, as you gather more data, if that's in fact appropriate. Yeah, yeah, and so we would love to see that. Uh, we have not yet done that experiment, but it's one. It's on the. It's on the agenda. Could, could you use sampling approaches? When uh, could you generalize your your um, you know your work to not, not likelihood as to get not likelihood uh, estimates, but you know use particle filtering, for example, or. This kind of ideas is it possible to formalize similar ideas? Uh, what filtering? Particle filters or you know sampling approaches. So what do you mean by sampling approaches in this case? Like par particle filtering. So approaches that don't uh, you don't compute you know like uh, like log likelihood uh, explicitly, but you yeah. know just sa sample some basically some from your data. Yeah, yeah, no, you could definitely do that. So the um, so you know what the analysis, the, the the formal analysis here, you know, involves the maximum likelihood parameter, etc. But you're quite right that the actually, if you if you actually sparse data, you have sparse data, yeah, yeah, from sparse data, you don't, you know, you you, you have some kind of sampling approach. You can definitely do that. And one of the things that will happen is that, for example, every one of the terms that was included there involves fluctuations. Right, because when you sample it, you get you know you estimate the maximum likelihood parameter depends upon the samples, so that'll have fluctuations. So you can you can you can include those analyses, and they will produce additional effects, especially when you have a small amount of data there. Yeah. So, uh, but I have not looked into that particularly carefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Great talk. Thanks so much. I think we can proceed with the final talk for this uh, first third session. Uh, right, Devika, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk. And yeah, I'll disengage you. And invite the Vika Marain to the screen. Let me do it in real time. Yeah, so the Vika is an assistant professor at the Erasmus Medical Center. Hi, the Vika. And I think we need to unmute you also. Okay. Hi, yep. There we go. Hello. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for your uh, for your talk and your contribution. Good to see you again. We met first uh, at MIT when we both had uh, you know research positions there a few years ago, and. Today, you're going to talk to us uh, about uh, neural circuits underlying Bayesian inference in time perception. So the floor is yours. OK. So uh, first, let me thank Vijay for this tip. I hope everyone can see my cursor. Let me know if you cannot. Uh, and yes, we can. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So let me, let me start by uh, thanking Dimitri, Earl, and Randy for the invitation. And uh, just to, you know, the, conversation has moved back to the other side of the pond and uh, this is a unique feature of uh, having these global conferences these days. So we already heard about two different flavors of uh, Bayesian inference uh, theory and uh, I'm going to talk about this through the lens of time perception. Um, time perception presents a very different challenge from um, say sensory systems or the visual system which is really the original inspiration for many classical frameworks about uh, implementation of Bayesian theory in, 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 in neural circuitry. So um, in, in timing, we don't have a dedicated sense organ or cortex for temporal processing. Uh, and in fact, if you look at uh, psychology experiments in timing, we might really be led to believe that humans are particularly bad at timing. And if you don't believe me, then let's consider a very standard uh, time interval paradigm, 
where uh, I present two consecutive stimuli, ready and set, they're flashes of light. And what your job is to measure the interval that elapsed between these two stimuli and make a response. Now, as the experimenter, I know the time that elapsed between the, this, and I'm going to call that the sample time. And hopefully from your response, I would be able to get some insight into what you perceive this time to be. So I can plot these two values against each other. And we would discover that as I give you increasing sample durations, the variability in your responses scales. And we call that scalar timing. Now, another interesting feature is that if I randomly sample the interval between ready and set from, say, a uniform distribution, so any of these intervals on any trial, then in that case, your responses at the edge of this distribution would become biased towards the center. And this is something what, that we call central tendency or fear odds law. So given that our timing um, our responses are susceptible to this kind of variability and bias, we really might be tempted to believe that we're quite bad at timing. And that runs against all of our intuition about our actual performance in the real world. Because how do we play on, in ensembles? How do we uh, perform well in sports or catch people on trapezes? So uh, the real world daily tasks are full of examples where we have actually quite good temporal precision. So let's try to resolve this conflict through the lens of mathematics. and uh, and. Basically, this gives us some insight that there is a real world time interval out there, but the brain only has access to a noisy measurement. And we can uh, model the relationship, the uncertainty in this measurement uh, by using a likelihood function. And because, as I mentioned, uh, the responses, the variability in responses scales over duration, we're going to model this likelihood such that the standard deviation of these likelihoods uh, in, uh, scales with duration. So these are two separate observations, two separate likelihood functions. Now, Following uh, discussions, I think Jonathan uh, uh, may have touched upon it, and I think Randy and uh, Vijay just had a very elaborate discussion about this. Uh, uh, this is, you may know something about the statistical distribution of this sample interval. Now, Jonathan was talking about natural statistics in the environment, you know, orientation and all of this. Um, and I think Vijay and Randy were just having a discussion about how do you internalize this and how much data do you need to internalize this? So I'm going to make that explicit here. I'm going to say, let's you do this experiment for hundreds and hundreds of trials. And we don't even look at the data until hundreds of trials. And then we assume uh, uh, that you have internalized this prior. And even then it may not be perfect, but we're just going to make that assumption for now. So if you combine <clears throat> this prior knowledge about this variable and this likelihood, you obtain a posterior distribution and what you can already see is that for each of these observations this distribution becomes truncated at the edges and now the question arises how do we derive an estimate from this posterior now in this particular case for reasons that i will explain later we pick the mean of this posterior and as you can see for these two curves this mean shifts inwards towards the center of the prior so i can now rotate this and plot uh, populate this graph for a lot of a continuum of measurements on the likelihood and what I obtain is a, a, a relationship between measured time and the Bayesian estimate and that relationship is actually a non-linear deterministic function. So what did we gain by uh, going through all this trouble and biasing ourselves in this manner? Well, so what are the advantages of, of including prior knowledge in this particular way? So for that, let's compare this to a non-Bayesian case. And that we see over here, on average in the non-Bayesian case, you just have the likelihood now. Uh, you're, you're pretty accurate, but uh, just you know the way we've modeled this and because of scalar variability, your variability is fanning out of control. Whereas in the Bayesian case, you may be biased here a little bit on the edges, but you have squashed a lot of your variability. And that means that the root mean squared error, which is a combination of both bias and variability, drastically reduces in the Bayesian case. And that is what we're referring to in this particular case as statistical optimality. It turns out that this is a, a great model for human behavior, for human time estimates. And today I'm going to talk briefly about how we replicated uh, these patterns in monkeys. So 
We've been uh, already talking about some of these frameworks. There, there are many frameworks that have been proposed for how uh, Bayesian inference can be, uh, and, and a wide variety of phenomena can be implemented in neural circuitry. A lot of this is, uh, has been actually inspired by sensory systems, especially the visual systems. And I will borrow from several of these perspectives to develop our intuition for time perception. But the central tenet here that we are going to assume is that if we can find a neural substrate that can encode this nonlinear deterministic mapping, which, mean, which represents the mean of the posterior, then we would find a neural circuit that could convert any measured time interval into a Bayesian estimate. And so we are looking for a circuit that could perform this particular transformation. And the idea is that we link theory to the behavior and we find signatures of this theory in the behavior and then move onwards to identifying exactly how this behavior originates uh, from the neural implementation. So uh, I will spend a considerable amount of time discussing at the estimation stage of this process. And then I will just give you the bottom line, our, our main results on what we found uh, in other work in, in production stage, and uh, spend a little bit of time uh, talking about some new results about how, um, uh, what, how neural circuits could acquire temporal prior knowledge uh, to be utilized for Bayesian computations. So let's start by asking, how can we test whether a monkey is able to perform Bayesian inference of time intervals? One criteria should be that uh, the responses of the monkey should be biased towards the mean of the prior. Now, if we were to train the monkey on a prior with longer intervals, then in that case, this particular, the, 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 the bias should be larger because these likelihoods will be flatter. Now, what if we could train the monkey to on cue switch between these two priors such that if I cued, say, red, the monkey knows that this prior will be sampled. And if I cue blue, the monkey knows this prior will be sampled. And there's one overlapping interval, which based on the cue would either cause the monkey to underestimate or overestimate the same time interval. And finally, we can calculate bias and variance estimates from the data and compare them directly to the model predictions. So these are the four uh, uh, criteria on which I'm going to uh, base whether the monkey had, is performing Bayesian inference or not. So here is what the task looks like. The monkey is fixating. And uh, if the queue, let's say on a given trial, the queue is red, um, a ready flash comes on, a set flash comes on. So the monkey has to reproduce this interval and it makes a delayed saccade, hopefully at the right time or around the right time, depending on perception. Now, on a trial where the red queue appears, any of these five intervals could uh, have been sampled. And if the trial, if the blue queue had appeared, any of these five intervals. Uh, what we see over here are the average responses of one of the monkeys. So we replicated the same in the others. And I'm going to superimpose on, onto this a line which represents the Bayesian estimate matched to the Weber fraction of the monkey. So um, in, I, we did a lot of uh, detailed analysis into this, but let me just take you to the whole gamut of results. Uh, here is where we look at the slope of the longer prior compared to the shorter prior. And you see that this is entirely consistent with, with this prediction, the model predictions. And finally, we can directly co compute the bias and the variance in the data and compare that to the model. So since all of that checks out, we have been also been recording from the, uh, from the uh, dorsal medial frontal cortex of the monkey while the monkey is performing this task. And here is an example of one of the neurons. Um, so in this particular case, the red cue is on and the, uh, the firing rate of this neuron is aligned to the time of ready. And what we see is that the neuron starts to modulate just before the time, just before the range of the prior. Uh, and the same neuron on a trial where the blue cue appears uh, stays low and only starts to modulate uh, in the range of the longer prior. And now I, I, I do want to make a link back to uh, the efficient coding theory that Jonathan was talking about in his uh, uh, presentation earlier. Uh, this, is, this would be consistent with the predictions of efficient uh, coding where the neuron is specifically modulating to represent prior knowledge. 
But without going into uh, too much detail about that, let's let's move on. So this type of neuron that modulates in this specific manner, we call these prior modulating neurons. And we find that about uh, 60 to 70 percent of the population that we recorded in both monkeys modulate in this specific uh, manner. And we did find a lot of uh, uh, heterogeneity in the data. But what one thing that was common was that there was this many neurons uh, increased or decreased their activity and then returned to their original state. Now, you could imagine that this collective rise and fall or fall and rise of neurons at the population level could manifest or would manifest in curvature. So that's what we see over here. Um, uh, we actually found for every behavioral condition for both monkeys, the neural population uh, curves in the duration of the, the range of the prior. And this led us to formulate uh, something we call the curvature hypothesis. And this pertains to a general property of semicircular geometries. If I took equidistant uh, points along this semicircle, and I projected these points linearly onto a vector that is parallel to the diameter of the semicircle, then we find that the distances between peripheral points become compressed to the center whereas distances in the more medial positions remain preserved. So if these were to represent time estimates, and I, I, and I plotted that against the actual time that was given, uh, these peripheral estimates would become biased towards the mean of the prior. So we can, we can test that theory. Here we see the, the, the Bayesian model. And uh, on top of this, we can regress uh, with just the projections of these curvature trajectories onto this linear vector. And what we see is that there is good agreement. And, and we did a lot of different analyses to support this. But for now, let me just take you to um, the kind of causal experiment that we were able to do in, in this particular case in silico. So what we did was we, we trained a recurrent neural network to recreate the performance of the monkey using the same task. There was a context queue. There was a timing queue. And the network is able to produce uh, 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 responses consistent with uh, Bayesian theory. And when we opened up the network and studied its dynamics, we found the same kinds of curvature. In fact, in this particular case, we were able to reconstruct the whole manifold. Now, the advantage of doing this in silico is that now we have the opportunity to directly go to the manifold and artificially perturb the state at different points such that it compresses towards the central position, the center of the prior. And then if we allow the linear readout to read out this, uh, this curve, what we find is that there should be increased compression. And that's exactly what we see here. 40% compression, 60% compression, the bias increases. So to summarize then, uh, we believe that we can recover neural states consistent with Bayesian estimates uh, uh, in this first stage of the task, where we hypothesize that prior knowledge bestows curvature on cortical geometries, which when read out through a linear readout, uh, yield uh, S states that are consistent with the Bayesian estimate. So now the question arises, how does the brain utilize these estimates to and convert them into time intervals? So we're going to deal with that in the next part of the talk, which I'm going to keep very short and just really give you the bottom line, the, the main insights from this work. Uh, and here we're going to directly cue the interval. So the monkey, when it sees a blue cue, it will produce a long interval, a delayed saccade or a button press. Actually, that's what you see over here. Depending on the color of the cue, the monkey produces a delayed saccade at different intervals. And depending on the shape, it, it either does a delayed saccade or a delayed button, button press. So monkeys are able to perform this task. Here are the responses on average 800, on average 1500 or close to it. And there is a lot of variability in the responses. And we are going to um, uh, utilize, harness that variability by binning them into smaller responses. So while the monkey was performing this task, again, we were recording from the medial frontal cortex. And here you see four examples from that data set um, of, of, four different, uh, of four different neurons. And you see that they're highly nonlinear, they're, they're heterogeneous. Um, and what I've done is I have the y-axis is exactly the same. I've just separated the activity of the neuron uh, into the short condition is on top and the, the, the long condition, the longer interval is at the bottom. And what you see is uh, a feature that we see generally across the data set. 
And that is if you take these red curves and you stretch them out, they start to resemble the blue curve. So what you're saying effectively, let me just, uh, oops, sorry, I, I skipped that. Yeah, so what you're seeing effectively is that there's a stretching and compressing of uh, neural activity uh, within the same neuron to encode different time intervals. And this is a phenomenon that we call temporal scaling when we want to quantify it across the entire population. So we do exactly what you just did. Stretch this out, compute an R square with the longer curve and call that R square a scaling index. So now what we can do is uh, plot a 3D histogram uh, to understand the distribution of scaling and clusters of the population. And what we see over here is that the mass of this distribution, the yellowest part, lies between 0.5 and 1 for the medial frontal cortical population. Um, what we can also do is identify the thalamic input to the medial frontal cortex uh, through antidromic stimulation. And we can compute, we can perform the same analysis on, on, that, on, that, uh, uh, on those identified neurons. And in that case, we would find that the mass, the, the peak of this distribution, looks fundamentally different from the cortical population and finds, its, uh, 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 finds the, the mass of the distribution is between 0 and 0.5. So uh, at the very least, we can say that the, the cortex is not inheriting this directly from thalamic input. So could there be a role for the thalamic input? Well, we investigated this further and I'm, I won't go into any of the details today, but just to tell you that what, what we found was that the thalamus was providing graded input that was Q related. Um, and this input was arriving at the cortex. And then we uh, used recurrent neural network modeling and also modeling at the single neuron uh, level to understand why does this graded, well, how could this graded input cause uh, uh, temporal scaling? And I won't get into either of these models, but I will tell you about the main intuition that we were able to glean from this. And that fundamentally is based on the idea that as you increase the input to the neuron, the output does not necessarily increase linearly. In fact, sometimes you can push the neuron into a regime where it non-linearly non saturates. And that means that for unit change, in unit change in input, you get less than a unit change in output. And what you've done is you've essentially changed the responsivity of the neuron. And in some, to some extent, you have changed the time constant. And that particular phenomena allows uh, uh, the same neuron to have an idiosyncratic activity profile that unfolds at different time scales. And so that's what we, uh, what I wanted to briefly let you know that the production aspect of this is uh, taken care of by potential interactions of graded thalamic input with cortical nonlinearities, leading to uh, uh, neuronal cortical activity unfolding at different time scales. And we replicated that finding from an earlier work in, in the work that I presented in the first half for the full Bayesian case. So, so we've been able to replicate that particular work. And that brings me uh, to the last part of this talk, where we address uh, where and how could neural circuitry acquire uh, these temporal priors and, and how could they be utilized for Bayesian computations. So uh, for this, um, well, we, we thought about where in the cortex were we recording? And, and these are prefrontal areas, MFC, <clears throat> DLPFC, and all of these areas receive inputs, heavy inputs from the ventral thalamus. They do so in monkeys, they do so in humans, they do so in mice. And the ventral thalamus, uh, uh, it, you know, this is fairly uh, well conserved across mammals, receives uh, heavy inputs from the cerebellum. Uh, the cerebellum has also been implicated in timing. And, uh, and so we, we, we decided to theoretically explore uh, the potential of the cerebellum as a uh, uh, circuit that could acquire time intervals and priors for time intervals. So for that, we modify uh, the ready, set, go task and, and relate it to a more classical task uh, called trace idling conditioning, where there is a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. So a light is briefly flashed. And after a fixed time interval, the, there is a air puff, a periocular air puff applied to the animal's eye. Um, and at the beginning, before learning occurs, the eye remains open 
and it closes only reflexively in response to the air puff. Now, as many such pairings are presented, the eye starts to close predictably. And this is called a conditioned response. And, and as learning progresses, you find that this, this response develops such that the eye is almost entirely closed at the time of the expected air puff. So an, um, um, analogous tasks and, and previous theoretical work actually uh, paves our way to understanding what might be the, the, the cellular and circuit underpinnings of this task. And we base our model on that. And that centers around the principal cell of the cerebellar cortex called the Purkinje cell. Uh, and the idea is that the condition stimulus, the light is coming in through the granule cell pathway. These axons of the granule cells, they ascend, split into T junctions, and then onwards they run parallel to the axis of the folium, and that's why they're called parallel fibers. Whereas the, the US or the air puff comes in through a separate pathway, and these axons entwine themselves as they climb up the arbor and are called climbing fibers. So uh, now I can rotate this and you see the radial cross sections of the, of the parallel fibers. And the color scheme is such that if all of them are the same color, then all of them are firing at the same time. But in fact, what we expect is temporal heterogeneity. And I'm not going to get into that at all, but this actually, the way we designed this basis set is consistent with what Jonathan touched on about the Deep Gangali um, Simoncelli work. Um, um, on on um, efficient coding, but but just to keep things simple for now, the, the idea is that the granule cells are firing at at different times, but are always time locked to the activity uh, to the time of the CS. And so what we have here is a reproducible temporal basis set, and at the synaptic level, the assumption is that any excess or any uh, reduction in the baseline activity of the Purkinje cell follows from changes in uh, uh, weighted inputs from the parallel fiber. And so when the US comes in, when the air puff comes in at a later time, only a subset of these granule cells are active at that time. And therefore only those uh, um, uh, synapses are conjunctively activated and undergo a weakening of the synapse. And that, that is known as long-term depression. So what we're doing here is we're modeling the rate of change in the synaptic weights with a term that represents conjunctive learning in a small number of synapses that are around the time of the air puff, but also a more generic long-term restoration to the baseline. So this dynamics uh, that we apply to a single interval can also be applied to a distribution. And this is what it, it looks like. So you can imprint different time intervals and entire distributions of time intervals in this manner. Synaptically, you can encode them into Purkinje cell activities. And the idea here is that now we have a representation of uncertainty and of previously experienced stimuli, which after sufficient number of trials um, are experienced, uh, starts to closely represent prior knowledge. So in fact, um, so this, this is actually uh, an example of when I said earlier in my talk that if we can find a neural substrate that encodes uh, uh, this nonlinear mapping, we would find a way to convert a measured interval into a uh, into a Bayesian estimate. So this is an example of that. In fact, if we t if we um, um, uh, integrate this with respect to a baseline, what we find is that this physiological model performs very similar to the Bayesian model compared to the non-Bayesian non model. And we can do this, uh, compare the prediction of the Bayesian model to, um, to the physiological model for different priors, different shapes. We can recapitulate uh, previous uh, psychophysical experiments uh, in, in, uh, for time intervals. And in fact, we've also performed in humans uh, trace eye blink conditioning experiments where we show that the trace eye blink response changes uh, with the statistics of the prior distribution. So two years ago, to, I felt like I had no choice. And to test this model, I, I became a cerebellar mouse physiologist. And so um, I won't go through these results in too much, too much detail, but just to let you know very briefly that we do find that even in mice, in exactly the same task, uh, the shape of the eye blink changes in a manner completely predicted. Every metric that we find in, in these behaviors we can predict with the model 
And the advantage is, of course, that with great anatomical precision, we can record from, from the cerebellar lobule that is responsible for it, that we identified, and we can physiologically identify Purkinje cells uh, specifically. Uh, and now we can check if these Purkinje cells show activity that is consistent with the model. And of course, we can characterize this across the entire population where we do find heterogeneity, but we also find a large number of cells that um, are also um, you know, suppressing. And we can perform a more direct test of whether suppression is the key mechanism. And here, what we can do is we, we introduce uh, channel rhodopsin only in Purkinje cells. And then at random during a session, only in 40% of the trials, we shine blue light during the expected time of suppression. And so that's what you see over here. What you see is control trials within the same session. The predictive response is entirely at, uh, intact. And this predictive response is the one that is sensitive to prior knowledge. Whereas on the 40% random trials where we, uh, we, where we uh, presented or we stimulated with, with blue light, uh, we found that the, the reflexive blink was intact, but the predictive response was entirely silenced. And we also recorded uh, Purkinje cells uh, during these sessions to ensure that the, the, the stimulation never took the Purkinje cell out of its natural firing rate range. So, um, so I just wanted to let you know that we are following up on this and, and it's taking uh, some time to get uh, those results, but hopefully we'll get there soon. So um, first of all, uh, prior in the first part of the talk, we talked about how prior knowledge warps cortical dynamics into curved geometries, which when read out linearly furnish states that are highly consistent with Bayesian time estimates and the monkey's behavior. Uh, next, in the second part of the talk, we uh, discussed how graded thalamic input may be re interacting with cortical nonlinearities to cause the stretching and compressing of neural activity, which we call temporal scaling. And finally, we propose a synaptic mechanism by which cerebellar circuitry could acquire a temporal prior knowledge. And we show that uh, you know hu human behavior is consistent with these predictions and uh, we're now conducting early investigations in uh, using behavior, electrophysiology, optogenetics in mice uh, that provide some support for this mechanism. And, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, tell that story very soon. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my mentors. Almost all of the work that I presented uh, today was performed at the Jazayeri lab uh, in Boston. And of course, in collaboration with the uh, two brilliant electrophysiologist uh, colleagues, Jing Wang and Hansen Son. And the, the recent part where, uh, about cerebellar physiology was done at the Diseo lab. And I'd like to thank my uh, technician, Maya Thronga. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your time. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see you. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much. Excellent talk. Um, so we have a couple of questions. I have my own, but uh, sure. maybe we open the floor also to, I don't know if Peter uh, wants to, to come to screen, I think I can invite them if they want, or I can uh, discuss their question. Peter, would you like to? Let's see. Join us. Oh. Hi. Oh, Hi. Great. That was a great talk. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, though, is uh, if you're proposing that the cerebellum is uh, computing the priors for doing the inference, uh, something like eyelid conditioning takes many hundreds of trials. But the, um, uh, the temporal bias experiments, you can get that bias in in, in a much shorter time frame. So how, how do you think about putting those two things together? So um, we definitely see differences across species. So we, we see even uh, differences across analogous tasks. For instance, if we performed a delay conditioning, you could train a mouse in five days. Trace conditioning takes 40 to 60 days. Uh, that's mice. We perform trace conditioning in humans and it takes five minutes. 
uh, for their eye blink uh, to sh reshape to the statistics. So we certainly see a lot of, and we should expect that if you, if you just look at the numbers and the convergence and all of the anatomy across species, you see uh, a, a lot of difference in foliation and in the you know, densities as you go from a mouse to a monkey to a human. So, so clearly, this is not the entire mechanism. So, certainly, I wouldn't uh, 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 take this mechanism uh, to directly account for the speed of learning, because there are other mechanisms like consolidation and um, uh, learning. So, so we don't know at this point. It's hard to tease apart how much of this is um, uh, ana anatomical, how much of this is species difference. So certainly, certainly the, the, the rate of learning there's another dimension to that that makes interspecies comparisons challenging. Great. Okay. So we'll say bye to Peter for the moment. Okay. And I think also there was another question. Let me invite Randy on uh, screen. Rani, are you there? Let's see. Maybe I can, uh, I don't know why, ah. Let's see if it works. Okay, so maybe, uh, ah, Rani with us. Yeah. Hi, Rani again. Yes. So I'm uh, very puzzled that you rely on what I regard as this completely indefensible assumption that uh, there are different dynamics in the granule cells in the light of the results that have come out of the Hessel lab, most particularly Frederick uh, Johansson's um, uh, experiments, which are surely well known to you. Well, they are, absolutely. Well, uh, uh, no, that I am aware of the results from Hessel lab. Uh, a lot of their work is in the decerebrated ferret and uh, we haven't fully understood, you know, like there's no behavior in that particular case that we can compare to. I, I, um, uh, I, I don't know if, if you might be aware that I think it was in 2017 February that there were suddenly two papers that came out. It was one of the first uh, times that we discovered granule cell activity. One was, uh, the first author was Wagner, it was from Leach and Luo's lab showing great heterogeneity in granule cell populations. Uh, it's a paper, in, I think it was Nature 2017. And the second work is actually in delay idling conditioning, very similar paradigm to trace idling conditioning, from Sam Wang's lab, uh, jointly co-authored by Giovannucci and Badura in 2017, February, in Nature Neuroscience, that where they show a, a very diverse heterogeneous granule cell uh, uh, activation pattern. So I wouldn't say that there's zero evidence. There is recent evidence. And since then, there, there is also evidence in uh, a larval zebrafish. So I think we are now discovering that there is heterogeneity in the granule layer population. And these are models that were earlier based on, I, I do understand that uh, uh, the Hessel lab has a different point of view on this, but uh, this has been an earlier point of view that we adopted from work of Mark and Medina and all of these people in earlier work. So I, I think the jury is out and maybe we need more uh, investigations, more calcium imaging studies uh, to understand this fully, but I certainly wouldn't say that there's no evidence for granule cell heterogeneity, especially in the light of this recent breakthroughs. So, I wasn't aware of those papers, so I'm glad to, I'm glad to learn about them. Uh, I'm but, very uh, happy to. It's very new, certainly. and it was very exciting for the field. Uh, but they certainly don't negate uh, Johansson's findings, right. uh, which it are extremely difficult to uh, to reconcile with that model. I mean, do you think you can reconcile it with that model? His no. findings. No, I, I, I think I think we we should um, uh, you know at the next cerebellar conference or something you know put together a symposium and and discuss how we can reconcile all of these findings together and what experiments need to be done to sensitively distinguish between they are such different paradigms in such different conditions decerebrated animals uh, or 
some of these studies will be done in anesthetized animals. Some of them are done, the calcium imaging studies on the granule cells I'm talking about are done in live awake behaving animals. So it's, it's hard to, and of course there's a lot of work where they look at different mutants. So what I'm trying to say is that we have a lot of different pieces of evidence and clearly we don't all agree in the field. But I think the time has come where perhaps we should, uh, um, you know, discuss this and find out what are the experiments that need to be done to reconcile the existing differences, perhaps. Yep. Yeah, great. So I have, a, I would be interested in if you can reconcile your second and third parts. Does the trace model give you predictions about the temporal scaling that you talked about? Did I? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it, it, it would actually. What you would need is um, uh, two different, the context you to, to activate two separate temporal basis sets. And as I was briefly discussing, if you, if you, uh, if you in, include uh, scalar variability into the basis set and you efficiently code it, then indeed it will be consistent with, the, with it. So the idea is that every context will activate its own basis set and it will imprint a different interval upon it. And we are actually also testing uh, these kinds of behaviors in mice and, and plan to do electrophysiological okay. investigations with that. But then, but then the model itself is the same, right? It's constrained. Uh, the, or... the model is the same. It, it, it becomes an hierarchical problem mm -hmm. with an additional layer where the context provides, oh, you know, in, in some sense, a hierarchical inference problem. I see, interesting, great. I think we should take a break and okay. convene about 50 minutes for the late session and Randy will take the lead there. And uh, yeah, so uh, we have to move. So for the next session, we will go on the top left, for those of you who are not that familiar with Crowdcast, and we'll move to from S0 that we are now to S1 session. So it will be a different uh, recording, basically. Nice seeing you. Everybody see you in 50 minutes, 5.15 London time. Bye -bye. I don't yet have a link I, to that next uh, session. Uh, I don't think. Uh, we'll, we'll talk okay, about it. Okay. okay, let's go off. Okay. Uh, yeah.